Hello everybody, welcome back to the YouTube channel. In this video I'm going to be forging a medieval longsword. This is a Okashot type 15A if you're into sword typology. I'm going to be using a leaf spring for the steel which should be 5160. After I've cut off a strip of the steel I'm going to heat it up in the forge to a red heat, straighten it out and then let it cool down. This will normalize the steel and hopefully reduce any stress which will lessen the chance of the blade warping or cracking as we forge the blade. So now that that's done, we can start to forge out the taper on the blade. The nice thing about the European longsword is it's a very simple blade shape, just a straight taper. We don't have to worry about any kind of recurves or curved blades or anything like that. So, this is fairly easy forging. After we've made the taper, I'm going to start forging out the bevels on the blade. We do this by holding the hammer at an angle to the anvil and holding the piece at such an angle that bisects the angle between the hammer and the anvil. This way we just forge out an even taper on both sides of the blade. It's important to work your way down the bevels on both sides of the workpiece to prevent it from corkscrewing this will happen if your angle of your hammer is different from the angle of your anvil relative to your workpiece. This will cause the blade to twist, so it's important to work on both sides to prevent it from twisting and keep the blade nice and even as you work down. After that's done, we're going to forge the tang. And this is just done by necking down where we want it and just tapering down the remaining stock. Okay, here's the blade as forged. Now we're on to grinding. I'm going to start off with an angle grinder just to remove the bulk of the hammer scale and rough marks, this will kind of reduce the stress on my belt sanding belts. And once I've done that, I'll move on to the 2 by 72 inch belt grinder to rough in the bevels and polish them up a little bit. We'll also profile the blade, make sure it's the right pointy shape that we want. And after that I'm going to put my touch mark into the blade. I like a nice deep mark in the blade, so I'm going to heat it up to a red heat with the oxyacetylene torch. And then simply stamp my mark into the blade. Okay, so I have the blade ground down to about the point where I want it. And now what I'm going to do is heat it up for normalizing and heat treatment. It's going to be kind of an issue heating something so long and trying to heat it evenly. So I have a couple of different ideas about how I'm going to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but you'll see in the video. So here's the forge I came up with. Just a long bed of charcoal bounded by two brick walls and the air input is just my forge blower blowing into a steel pipe that runs the length of the forge. First I'm going to go for a couple of normalizing heats by heating the blade up to red hot and letting it cool down in the air slowly. Again to reduce the stress in the blade and hopefully reduce any warpage. Next we're going to heat treat it by quenching it in corn oil
and while the blade is still relatively warm it can be straightened so if there's any warpage as there was a little bit here I can straighten that out the hardness of the blade can be tested by skating a file along the edge so this is the setup I came up with it's just my forge burner at the bottom heating up my quenching container full of uh, corn oil and I have a thermometer at the top to measure the temperature it looks a little janky but hopefully it'll work okay this setup actually worked quite well for tempering the blade I put it in there for an hour and a half at about 450 degrees Fahrenheit Okay, so here's our blade after tempering, and as you can see, it's flexible, yet springs back to its original position. Still very hard, so I'd say that's pretty good. So now we're on to polishing the blade. I start at 150 grit sandpaper and work my way up to 400 grit. This is quite a long process, so I'll cut most of it out for the sake of keeping the video short. After I've polished it up to 400 grit, I like to go over it with some triple zero steel wool. I find this reduces any irregularities in the 400 grit finish and gives it a nice final look. Okay, now we're on to forging the guard. Here I'm making the drift for the guard, which is a piece of steel, the same width and size of the tang of my sword, and I'll force this through the guard to ensure that the opening fits exactly with the sword tang. So there's our completed drift. Now we're on to forging the guard. For the guard, I'll be using 3 quarter by 3 quarter square mild steel. Here's the punch I'll be using, and as you can see, I'm going to punch about one and a half times the width of the slot punch. And then we simply punch the hole in the guard. We want to be sure to cool off our tool regularly to ensure that it doesn't overheat and ruin the temper on the slot punch. You can see I've gone quite a few heats without tempering, without cooling it off, which I shouldn't have done. So now we're going to flip it over and just punch out the slug on the back. Now I'm going to draw the quillons, the arms on either end of the guard. I want these to have kind of a uh, recurve shape, to be go thinner and then get thicker towards the ends. So I'm going to draw it out over the horn to do that. And now I'm going to force the drift through to make the size of the hole correct. 
Now I'm drifting it quite hot here, so I will need to force the drift through one more time at a low red or a black heat because this will cool and uh, shrink considerably as it cools. There's our finished guard, and now we're going to polish it up on the belt grinder. I'm going to grind along the diagonals, so it's an octagon in cross-section. And now we're on to forging the pommel. So for the pommel I'm using a large block of mild steel, and just forging down an octagonal taper. After I do this, I'm going to round over and upset the end slightly. This will be the wide end of the pommel. And after that, I'm going to grind it to refine the shape of the octagon. Okay, and now we can drill the hole through the center of the pommel, through which we'll fit our tang. And after that we're going to widen up the end of the pommel slightly, that we can fit the wide end of our tang through. Okay, so as you can see I've tapered down the end of the, the tang here, uh, just like so, and drilled out the pommel, so it will fit on there, and after I've assembled it together with the handle I can rivet over this end. So that's how it's going to fit together so far. Now I'm just going to polish up this a little bit more and then start working on the handle. So after that's done I'm going to take a piece of maple. The kind of wood doesn't really matter, I just had a piece of maple lying around and chisel out an opening for the tang. After I've chiseled out this channel, I will glue another piece of wood onto the top. This is a handy way of making handles if you don't need to see the edge of the wood, as I won't be here. I'll be covering the handle in leather. So the tang fits pretty well into the handle. Now we can glue another piece of maple onto the top, clamp it down, and allow that to dry. Okay, here's the dry fit of the handle before we rivet the whole thing together.
And here I'm going to apply some epoxy to the tang and the inside of the handle. This is mainly to fill any gaps between any gaps that are left in the handle and not so much for adhesion as the riveted over tang will provide plenty of strength for the handle. Now I'm going to heat up the end of the tang with an oxyacetylene torch and peen over the end. This will provide a very strong construction for the handle. Okay, I've wrapped the handle in cord and onto that I'll glue a layer of thin leather, which I'm cutting out here. This is about 0.8 millimeter thick leather. And before I do that, I'm going to glue several strips of leather onto the handle. This will make it a bit more aesthetically appealing and also provide extra grip onto the handle. Before I wrap the leather, I'm going to skive the edges of it with a Dremel using a sanding disc. This way I'll thin out the edges of the leather so that my seam isn't quite as thick. And now I'm going to glue the leather onto the handle. I'm using a uh, kind of contact glue, I believe E6000 is what it's called. In hindsight, I would have preferred a slightly less viscous glue that would have been easier to spread. But it seemed to work very well. So I'm going to apply that to the whole thing. And wrap the leather in string just to hold the whole thing together while the glue dries. This will have the added benefit of imprinting the leather with the shape of the string. This will make it look pretty nice and also provide a very secure grip. So several hours later, I'm going to unwrap it and see how it turned out. So here I'm just going to dye the leather. I'm using uh, Fibing's brown leather dye. It seemed to work quite well. And after that's done, I'm just going to wax the handle to provide a nice waterproof finish for the handle. Okie dokie, so we have the handle all stained and waxed. Uh, it is completed. And as you can see, it's taken the imprint of the string very nicely, and that gives a very good grip. And on the back side, you can see the seam a little more than I'd like to, and also it's not quite as straight as I'd like, but overall I think it turned out very well, and the, the front definitely turned out very nicely. So here is this long sword, uh, just about completed. It balances somewhere like four inches down from the guard and the blade is a hair over 36 inches long the handle is 10 inches long and it weighs just about three pounds three pounds six ounces i believe also the cross guard is 10 inches in width and the blade is just a little bit under one and three quarters inch wide and tapering off, of course, and about 0.2 inches thick. So the one thing we have left to do is sharpen it. It's still blunt, so we'll do that and then test it out. Before I sharpen it, I thought I'd show you how I made the scabbard for this sword. So I'm going to take two strips of poplar wood, router out a space for the blade between them, and I'm going to coat this space in... I'm going to coat these grooves in felt. This will provide a nice smooth draw for the sword. 
Okay, here's the wooden core for the scabbard. Now I'm going to coat it in leather. So here I am stitching up the leather. This is a very long and laborious process. I doubt you'll want to see all of it, so I'll just go ahead and skip most of that. After that's done, I'm going to dye the leather. Same process as before. Nothing special about this. And I've made a metal shape to fit over the tip of the scabbard. So here's how this setup works. The top piece is simply connected via a buckle to your main belt. And the bottom strap is connected to a longer belt loop that also attaches to your belt. So you can simply wrap the belt around. and tie this as was fashionable in the 15th century. And there you have it. You can simply draw it from there. All right, now back to our regularly scheduled sharpening. I'm going to start on the belt grinder for this and move on to several sharpening stones to finish off the edge. And here's the completed sword. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like or a comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos like this. Thank you.